Good morning, everybody. Welcome back. So I'm going to get right to it today because we have a lot to talk about, and there's cool stuff that we're going to get to uh, in the second half of today's lecture. So this is our last day where we're going to be together talking about imperative or declarative programming. That's it. On Friday, we're going to start talking about objects and object-oriented programming. That, along with some discussion of data structures, um, recursion, some, you know, I'd, I'd like to bring in some concepts from functional programming, because that's something that's been starting to be supported in Java towards the end of the semester. So we're going to have a lot of fun throughout the rest of the semester. But this is kind of like the end of an era, the end of the first unit in this class. We're, we're almost a third of the way through the semester. Next week, we have our first midterm. Um, and that's going to cover kind of all the material up through today. On Friday, we'll start talking about objects. We'll have homework next week on object-oriented programming. Next Monday, we will have a review for the midterm here, where we'll go over some problems together um, and answer any questions that you might have. All right. So as promised, a little bit of review from quiz three. I just took a couple of questions. We'll do a little bit more of the review of the programming style questions on Monday. So. You know, being able to identify return types, so this was a question on the quiz. For some reason, a lot of people got this wrong. Um, if, you know, this is the kind of thing you're struggling with, I would encourage you to, to, to sort of practice. So, you know, the name of the function is right here, get all values. What's the return type? How would you say it? Sort of think it to yourself. This function returns a one-dimensional array of doubles, right? So I've got the type here, and then my brackets I'm just doing this for fun. Uh, my brackets that um, show that I've got an array. If I had two or three sets of brackets, that indicates the dimensionality of the array that's being returned from the function. All right. What about this guy? Uh-oh. Okay. I'm stuck up here. That's not what I want. Break. This was another, you know, commonly missed question. This one you just kind of had to walk it through. So this is an example of a, of a question where, you know, in order to get this one right, you just need to sort of execute it in your head, you know? So uh, the for loop, in theory, will execute 10 times, but we can see because of the break statement on line five and the conditional expression on line four, it's not gonna get, it's not gonna get through 10 times because as soon as index is greater than five, I'm gonna break and I'm gonna execute the loop. <laughs> I have a value of counter that essentially is keeping up with index within the loop. So if you walk through this, what's the right answer here? Six. Right, so when does, when do I execute the loop? I execute the loop when index is, is six, right? Five is not greater than five. Six is greater than five. Every time I get here, um, well actually is it six or seven? I think it's six, yeah. So I'm incrementing the counter each time. By the time I hit that last break statement, I've, in I've incremented the counter six times. All right, good. Okay. So I've got a couple of, this is like, uh, for the next five, ten minutes, we're just gonna do a little grab bag of other imperative programming constructs that you might see in the wild. These are not things we're gonna use in class, they're not things we're gonna expect you to use on MPs, but I just want you to have seen them so that if you're reading code in the future, you come across something like this, you're not totally confused. Obviously, you can look it up, but, um, and these can be useful. These are more esoteric, right? You have seen the main building blocks of how we structure computer programs, and that's gonna be true even when we talk about objects, right? The methods that we write for objects are gonna be built out of these same imperative programming pieces. But there's a couple of ones that, just, again, I wanna throw out there. These are kind of the oddities, the oddballs, so, remember the while loop? I've got a loop, I have a condition. The way that the while loop is structured is designed to remind you that the condition is tested each time before I enter the block. So it's possible that I can write a while loop that sometimes doesn't execute at all. Because when I get to the condition, it's false, I never enter the loop, and I just continue with whatever code follows. The while loop has a relative. It's called a do while loop. And the structure of this loop is, again, designed to give you a hint about how it might be different. Notice that the condition here appears at the bottom. The block is the first thing you see. So you see do, and I open a block on line one, I have some code in there, and then there's a condition at the bottom. 
So you might be thinking, what's the difference here? You know, the, the visual structure of these is designed to help me figure out what the difference is. So I've got an example here, my while loop at the top. So that says while i is less than zero, i starts out with what value? Zero. Is zero less than zero? No. Will that statement on line three ever be executed? No. So I don't expect to see the print from that while statement ever when I run the code. What about the do while, though? If I'm just reading through this, this says do this while i is less than zero. Let's try this and see what happens. Okay. So this highlights the important difference between these two constructs. The while loop, the condition is tested before I enter the block. If it's true, I execute the code in the block, return to the top. Test it again, if it's true, still true, I keep going. With the do while loop, the first time the code is always executed. So the block of a do while loop will always run at least once. I execute the block, then when I get to the bottom, I check the condition. So what happened here is I got to line seven, Java says it's a do while loop, I'm gonna run the block, I ran the block, I printed do while, and my counter, I got to the bottom, it said should I keep running a loop? I is, zero is not less than zero, and so I stopped, right? Again, minor difference. There are some times, and this is one of those things that, you know, from time to time, you'll be writing some code, and you'll be like, this is, you know, my while loop's getting a little gross here. Um, is there a way I can make this a little bit cleaner, and the do while loop will come in handy? There are some places where this is really indispensable. That's why it exists. Um, most of the time, you're not gonna use it. Okay. Another little bit of programming esoterica for you. So, the if statement. Basic building block of decisional, um, you know, decision-making logic in computer code. It also has a relative. That relative is called a switch statement. So if you, and, and a switch statement can be useful in a couple of cases, particularly if you find yourself writing a really, really big if statement. So if this, if this, if else this, if else this. If you start to, you know, have four, ten, eight conditions chained together as part of this same if statement, a switch statement may be more appropriate. But switch statements are also a little bit more interesting. So a switch statement, I can only test primitive types in strings in Java. That's the only thing I can, I can use a switch statement for. Those case labels can only match primitive types in strings. But, remember with an if-else statement, only one of those blocks, at most one, sometimes zero, of the blocks in an if-else statement will be executed. In a switch statement, it's possible for multiple statements to be executed. I'll show you how to do this. So what happens is that, we'll go through an example, the switch statement starts evaluating cases. As soon as it finds one of the cases that's true, it will run the block of code associated with that case. If you don't stop it, it'll keep going. And it'll also run any other case statements that turn out to be true. So unlike an if-else statement, where at most I ran one block, and sometimes I ran zero, a switch statement can execute zero blocks, it can execute four blocks. All right, let's see an example of this. Again, I don't want to dwell on this because it's not something you see a huge amount. So here's the switch statement. The format of this is that the thing that, the, the variable that's being tested goes, or the condition that essentially, the thing I'm evaluating goes um, in the declaration of the switch statement. And then I have cases that match the values. So this essentially says, switch on the value of test, and then I have case zero, case one, case two, case three. So it's going to look for something that matches. Let's see what actually runs when we run this piece of code. Okay. So what happened here? I evaluated case zero. I said, is test, is, is test equal to zero? No, test is equal to two. So I didn't execute that. I executed case one, is test equal to one? No, I didn't execute that either. Then I got to case two, and it said test is equal to two. Okay, I'm gonna start executing things. 
and it ran the print. And then it keeps going. It will actually continue to execute statements within the switch statement, uh, even though those cases aren't true anymore. If I want to make it stop, I can do that. I can stick an extra break statement here. So now what happened? And this is, this is terrible syntax. I should be ashamed of myself. Let me do this properly. Okay? So how you would really do this is I would do this, and then I think I can open up the block here. Bingo. Yeah. So what happened in this case? I got down to case two. That was true. I executed that block, but that block included a break statement. This is the other use of break in Java. A break will also break out of a switch statement. So when the switch sees a break, it just stops and exits. You'll see there's this special case here at the bottom called default. That's used if none of the other things are true. It's optional, you don't have to provide it. But in this case, you'll see, even if I pick something that doesn't match any of my case statements, the switch will fall through and execute the code on line 10. Okay. Awesome. So. We have talked about pretty much everything you need to know about imperative programming. Questions at this point before we go on and talk about some interesting stuff. Yeah. Imperative programming is what we've been doing. So throughout this, and this will be more clear once we talk about a couple of other styles of programming. So imperative programming, you can think of as imperative. You're giving the, you're telling the, the, the computer exactly what to do. Later in the course, we're gonna talk about some other styles of programming. So object-oriented programming is really more of a way to structure our programs. We'll start talking about that on Monday. But there are other ways of telling a computer how to solve certain problems. So we're gonna talk about recursion in this class. We'll get to that in a couple of weeks. So that's a different problem-solving strategy that involves breaking a larger problem down into smaller pieces and then assembling a solution from those pieces. Again, I'd also like to introduce you to some features of functional programming in this class, which is a style of programming that rather than telling the computer exactly how to accomplish each little part of the task, I give the computer a strategy that I want it to follow. And then um, the, the program will follow that strategy and be able to solve the problem. So again, this will become more clear as we go. It's a great question. Other questions here before we do some fun stuff, yeah. Yeah. No. Yeah. So, question was, can I skip case statements? Can I do like one and three? No. I gotta, you know, I either, I essentially start when it matches and I stop when I get to a break, right? There's no way to jump over ones in between. Yeah. What's that? Can I use a conditional statement in a switch? Continue, no. It's not a loop, right? So there's nowhere to go back to. Yeah, good question. The question was, can I use a continue statement inside of a switch? So a switch is not a loop, it's not gonna repeat. Right? It's never gonna go back to the top, it's only gonna go down. So good question, yeah, right here. Default will catch any cases that aren't matched by the, the labels above, yeah. So. Let's go back here. You see my example. I set test to 10. There's no case that actually matches test. And so if I, if I omit default, nothing will happen, right? It won't print anything. So I can, t I don't have to have a default. In this case, it just prints, doesn't print anything, right? Um, if I put in a default, it'll catch anything that falls through to that point. Good questions. Any other questions? Yeah. What's that? I don't know if it will or not. Let's try that. So the question was, how do the brackets work in a case statement? Yeah, so, so I think, so the brackets are nice for clarity. The way that the switch statement works is it looks for the next case statement, right? So the block starts at a case and ends at the next case, right? Or with the last case, it ends with the end of the switch statement. Yeah. I would encourage you to use those, though, because they make the code more clear. Uh-huh.
So it'll start at the first matching case statement, and it'll execute everything and gets to, until it hits a break. So it doesn't just execute the default, it will actually execute case three as well. Yeah, good question. Yeah. What's that? So I think the question is, can I, uh, how can I describe the case statement? So this is one of the limitations of the switch statement in Java. I can only match against, like I said before, primitive types and strings. In other languages, I can put more complicated logic inside a case statement, right? You can think of the case statement as just executing some conditional logic. It's essentially saying, is test equal to two? There are other languages where I can write more complex case statements. In Java, I'm limited to, to matching against primitive types and strings. Great question. Okay, so let's, let's talk about something fun. So this is a digression. Some of this material will be on a quiz in sort of a fun way, um, but I also think it's an important moment in the semester to, to step back a little bit and tell you a little bit about how some of the things that you've been doing are actually working under the hood. This is also a fun chance to talk a little bit about some little bits of computing history um, and sort of why Java is the way it is, and also I'm gonna introduce you to an a, a cool new feature in Java 10 that some of you might like to start using. That's actually kind of useful. Okay. So, so far we've been, we, you know, we've given you instructions about how to, com you know, uh, work on the MPs. And, you know, when you run things on the slide playground, you like click and it runs, right? And when you use Prairie Learn, there's a button that says submit, and then something happens, that little thing goes like that, and then there's the result. But what's actually happening when you do these things? What actually happens when you hit the play button in IntelliJ? What actually happens when you hit return on our slide playground? What actually happens when you hit the grade button um, on Prairie Learn? So as, as part of being a computer scientist, and this is something that will, will really pay off, I, I promise you, developing a curiosity for how things actually work. And this is one of the fun parts of my job teaching this class, but also something that I would encourage you to develop as sort of a, a an attribute of your experience as a computer scientist, how you approach the world, wanting to know how technology works, right? You know, why can I connect to the internet in this building, right? How does Facebook work? How does Facebook, you know, know certain things about me? Why does it, you know, present certain information to me or not present certain information to me, you know? Why is it that I can edit a photo on my phone and do certain things to it and run certain filters? Like, how do these things actually work? Many of the questions that you will ask about the world around you today have an answer that's rooted in technology. And if you find out a little bit more about it, you'll know more about the world. You know, I am telling you this partly because I don't feel like I started doing this early enough, you know, developing this curiosity about the world of technology. I kind of did what I was supposed to and, you know, got the things to work that I was supposed to work on, but I never sort of like stepped out of my lane a little bit and was like, why, right? Why does this particular thing work? What's actually going on? So again, this will be something that will really serve you well, um, because what you find out will be super, super interesting most of the time, and there's all these fantastic stories about how we got here, right, some of which we'll talk a little bit about today. This hopefully will also clear up a little bit of confusion, right? We've been using these words like there's a compiler error. What does that mean? What is compilation, right? Um, so hopefully this will make a, a few things more clear, right, um, that we've been doing. And again, this is also super interesting. So in the next, you know, 30 minutes, I do not have enough time to get into any of the details here. And the details about exactly how this stuff works consume multiple classes that you may take in the future. So I'm drawing a material that gets presented in 233, 241, 421, other courses in our you know, in our program, a little bit of stuff from 225, right, that plays a role here as well. But this is a big, sort of beautiful, complex story that touches a lot of different parts of computer science. And there's no way that I'm gonna be able to do the details justice in half an hour. If you have questions, I will be more than happy to try to answer them on the forum. Okay, so what happens when you run your Java code? And this is true, again, no matter where it runs. The details are different whether you're running it in our slide playground or on Prairie Learn or IntelliJ, but the process goes like this. There are two main steps. So the first part is called compilation. 
there is a step in the process where the Java source code that you have written gets converted into a different type of computer code. This is called Java bytecode. And compilation is a common process. There are uh, lots of programming languages out there in the world that you will use that share this feature, where the first step is that they get compiled. C gets compiled, C++ gets compiled, Go gets compiled, Rust gets compiled. There are other languages that don't have this step. And so that's an interesting thing to, to find out more about. But Java is a compiled language. So the first step is I compile it. So the compilation process is a transformation. And it's an incredibly interesting transformation. Like I said, you can take a whole course on compilers. The goal is to take the code you wrote in Java source code and transform it into this other type of representation of what you want the computer to do, which is called Java bytecode. That is done by a tool called Java C. This is Java C. C stands for compiling, the Java compile. The next thing that happens, assuming that everything went right, okay, so sorry, so errors at this stage are called compiler errors. You have seen some compiler errors when you've written code for Prairie Learn. You've seen it when you've written code for our slide tool. You've seen it when you've written code for IntelliJ. There are certain cases where the compiler can't make heads or tails of what you've written, so it can't transform it into Java bytecode. There are other times when the compiler has noticed things about your code that are a problem, and it will say, I'm not gonna compile that because I think you've made a mistake. So there's, there's two types of these. We'll look at both in a minute. If your code doesn't compile, it cannot be executed. So if I can't, if Java can't create this bytecode, nothing happens. The whole process just stops at this point until you fix these issues. The next stage is something we call execution. So broadly speaking, running your Java code requires both compiling it from Java source code to Java bytecode and then executing that Java bytecode. There's another program that you installed on your computer when you install Java that is responsible for running Java bytecode. That program is sometimes just called Java, right? So I've got Java C to do the compilation, and then I have a separate program called just Java that actually executes bytecode. We're gonna show you how this happens with a simple example um, in a few minutes. There are, it's still possible that there are errors that occur at this point as your code runs. These errors are distinguished from the compiler errors. So there are some errors that occur when I compile my code, when I'm transforming it from Java source code to Java bytecode, and then there's a separate class of errors that occur as the code runs. We refer to these as runtime errors. And one thing I'm gonna come back and talk about in, the middle, in a few minutes is one of the goals of our community as programmers is to essentially, you know, reduce runtime errors at the potential cost of creating more compile time errors. We would much, much rather that errors occur when you try to compile your code than when you try to run it. Okay, so let's look at some different examples of compiler errors, right? So I have written something in this editor. This is not Java source code, right? It won't, you know, maybe you wish it was Java source code, right? At some point, maybe we'll get to the place in computers where you can give them this kind of instruction, right? That would be kind of great. I guess we would have to come up with different MPs. Um, but for now, this is not valid Java source code. I can ask the Java compiler to compile this code. And if I do that, I'm gonna get some type of error. You know, it, 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 who knows? So in this case, it says compiler error, right? This code didn't compile. It's not very surprising. This is not valid Java source code. And you know, who, who knows what the error message is going to be? Because this is just gobbledygook, right? Um, if you feed gobbledygook into the compiler, you know, at some point something is going to break, but the error message is not usually very interesting, right? Or very useful, I should say. All right? So, so here's a different example of a compiler error, and this is a little bit more useful to you because this might be, um, this might match something that you might try to do. So there are times when the compiler just can't make heads or tails of what you're trying to do at all, and just gives up. That was the previous example, where, you know, whoever, you know, whatever joker is writing this isn't even trying to write Java source code. In this case, I'm trying to write Java code, right? But I've made a mistake. 
Many of you can probably see this right now. So I'm, I'm declaring a variable on line one. It's called instructions. What's the type of that variable? It's an int. But I'm initializing that variable with what? A string literal. And so the Java compiler is gonna stop. It's gonna help me here. It's gonna say, you can't do that. So here's another compiler error. Assignment conversion not possible from type Java lang string to type int. So this is a case where this is syntactically correct. The Java compiler can parse it and can figure out what I'm trying to do. But what I'm trying to do is not allowed by Java. Java has a strict type system, meaning that I can't just take something, a variable that I've declared to be an int, and randomly assign a string to it. This, this won't work. This is the compiler that, again, is designed to be helpful. Maybe you forgot that you wanted instructions to be of type string, so you fix that. Maybe you thought that you wanted to initialize instructions to an int, but something's wrong with this line of code. The compiler is gonna tell you that. Okay, so let's look at the next style or the next category of error. So this code will compile, but it's wrong. What am I doing wrong here? This is a very, hopefully blaringly obvious error. Yeah. Yeah, I've got, um, you know, you might think that you will never write code like this, but I've had friends that have written code like this, right? Frequently, but they've been up all night. You know, I remember, you know, back in college, working on these really gnarly assignments and our equivalent of 241, and at a certain point, a friend of mine was having this sort of problem where he was having a crash that was being caused by a null pointer, and he, he finally realized that, like, I mean, it wasn't this obvious. There might have been two lines in between, but it was, like, variable set to null, and then two lines later, try to use that variable to do something, right? So this won't run. And if I try to run it, what's gonna happen is I'm gonna get a runtime error. So this code was able to be compiled by Java. The Java compiler ran, it converted this to bytecode, and then I executed it. But when I executed it, I encountered a different problem, which is that I had this variable that's of type string, I set it to be null on line one, and then I try to access one of its methods, and I know that I can't do that with a null object. This will always cause a problem. Okay. So one of the things that we're trying to do as we build better languages, so if you look at the Java-like languages that have evolved over the past few years, things like Kotlin and Groovy, if you look at more, you know, languages that have come out more recently that try to, you know, improve on Java's approach to type safety, one of the things we're trying to do is figure out how to get the compiler to detect more errors. I don't want runtime errors. I would much prefer compile time errors. Why? Who wants to take a stab at this? I would always prefer a compile time error. Yeah. So they're easier to find and debug, but part of that has to do with when they happen. Yeah. Okay, so the compiler might provide a little bit better information about the error. That's also true, but... Yeah, so when do you compile your code? You compile your code before it runs, before you try to demo it to, you know, the VCs on, you know, Sand Valley Road or whatever, right? Before you try to install it on, like, a million Android devices all over the world, right? That's when you have compiler errors, when you're developing your code. The runtime errors happen later. So if the more errors I can catch when I'm compiling and developing my code, the better. And one of the stories about modern computing from a software development perspective is that compilers have gotten a lot more intelligent. Part of that is because computers have gotten a lot faster. And so one of the things that we're trying to do is use compilers to help us more as we develop our code so that we don't have runtime errors. Does this make sense? So, when, like, let's say you're building some sort of server application you're gonna, you're gonna ship to a client. As you're compiling, the compiler is saying, okay, this is a problem, this is a problem, and you fix those problems, and then at some point you send them a piece of, of Java binary to run, and then they install it and run it. 
Now, if it runs for weeks and weeks and weeks without ever hitting a runtime error, you're golden, right? You're gonna get a bonus. If it hits runtime errors every day and keeps crashing, it's gonna be super frustrating. So again, that's why we want to avoid these. Yeah, Jeremy. Can you explain to me why you want to test Oh, of course. Yeah, we're not talking about testing today, right? Testing is an important part of modern software development. We will come back and talk about this. Absolutely. So, so Jeremy's observation is, can't I test it? Yes, and you should, right? So testing is another way that we try to reduce runtime errors, and we will, we'll talk about that more, yeah. Okay. So, and so you might wonder, this is one of the questions about Java that's very curious. Why can I even compile this code? Like, is the compiler so dumb that it can't realize that on line two, I create a string variable called s, and I set it to null, and then on line three, I try to access its length properly? Like, why is this even okay? So you might wonder this, right? And in newer languages, you won't be able to get away with this, because the compiler's gonna help you. It's gonna be like, hey, by the way, um, that's gonna blow up right away. I know, right? I'm a compiler, I'm smart, right? Okay. So let's see these, you know, so I told you there was this tool called Java C, I told you there was to this tool called Java. Let's actually see those in action. So I need to switch to casting my desktop and share. Okay, awesome. Can you guys see this? This is like as big as I could make it without losing some amount of self-respect. Um, okay, so so let's so let's do this. So, you know, if, if you're on a Mac, you can follow along with this. If you're on a Windows machine, it's a little more complicated. But there is a file on your computer called Java C. Where that's located, we're not gonna worry about. That file is a program that I can use to, like I said, compile, transform Java source code into Java bytecode. So in this directory, I have a piece of Java source code that I created, and I'm an old fogey. I use a very old fogey-ish editor called Vim. This is not that different from IntelliJ, except it doesn't have any features. Um, but it allows me to edit files. So this is the contents of this file. This is called test.java, and this has a little bit of code in it, and maybe some things that you've seen on some of our MPs. Some of the structure of this, remember, as we go through the semester, we're zooming out. So we've been talking about functions, we've been showing you how to work with sort of simple imperative programming. Starting on Friday, we'll start talking about objects, and a lot of this will make more sense, particularly the first line. But for now, this looks like something you're familiar with. So, you know, I've got, I have a, I have a method here that's called main, and I've got all these modifiers in front of it, and we're gonna ignore those for a moment, although we'll talk about them in a minute. And on line three, I have a, a, a line of Java source code that should look very familiar to you. I'm just printing something. Okay. So the first step here is to compile this piece of Java source code. So let's do that. I'm gonna run a program called Java C. It's installed on my computer. I installed this when I installed the Java 10 software development kit and I'm gonna uh, ask it to compile test on Java. If everything goes according to plan, it just returns. Okay, but what's happened? So when I started, I had a file called test.java, and now I also have a file called test.class. That file contains Java bytecode. I can, oh, I can try to open it up using Vim, I don't, okay. So if I try to open it up using Vim, you can see that this is not a text file. There's, there's binary data in here. There is a program that I can use that ships as part of the Java software development kit called Java P that will allow me to decompile this. So this is, this is the contents of this, and I am not getting into this by any means. Um, but what is in here is a series of Java bytecode instructions. So you can see down here, I have, this, this is a Java bytecode instruction. If you looked up Java bytecode, there are references online, and you would see descriptions of what get static means, what LDC means, what invoke virtual means. Return, you might be able to guess what that does. So I've compiled my code. I've taken test.java, and I've created bytecode in test.class. If I remove test.class, see it's gone, and then I run the compiler again, 
that file will be recreated. Okay? So let's introduce a compiler error, just so that we can see this. So let's just put in like a random syntax error here. It's one of my favorites. Um, and now I'm gonna remove test.class, and I'll try to run the compiler again. And you can see, this is not that different than the information you've been seeing when you've used Prairie Learn, right? If you look at the output from the compiler, if you use our slide tool. Every Java compiler produces error messages that are slightly different, but what is this saying? It says there's a problem on line two. You know, it says identify or expected, but this is something that frequently pops up when I just have sort of garbage in my code. So let's edit this again. We'll get rid of this guy. And now I should be able to compile my code. Compilation completed successfully. I've got a class file. Okay. So again, nothing printed. This has not been executed yet. How do I execute it? I'm going to use the Java command. All right, so I'm going to, uh, Java. I'm going to provide it a single argument here, test. That's the name of the class file that I want to execute. So what do you think is going to happen when I do this? Incredibly exciting. It printed here. There you go. So this is extremely simple, but this is, again, this process. And there's a lot of complexity that I'm glossing over, but this process happens every time you compile code in IntelliJ, every time you use our, so when you use our playground in the slides, what happens is that your code gets shipped off to a server that's running on campus, that server very quickly compiles and executes it, and whatever is printed to standard out gets shipped back to you and displayed in the window below your code. And that happens fast, which is cool. Okay, let me, well, you know what, I'll just leave this here for now, just in case we wanna come back to that in a minute. So one of the things that's interesting about Java is that Java, so there are compilers, like the C compiler. So when you run the C compiler, the process is not very different, except what's produced by the C compiler is actually something called machine code. It's code that an actual computer CPU can execute. So when you compile your C code, you compile it and then you run that program directly. You don't need to use this program called Java to execute it. All right? Java is different. It compiles into this thing called bytecode, which is then run by another piece of software. So this seems weird. Why am I doing this? It's like an extra step here. I take Java source code, I compile it into bytecode, and then I have to use this other program called Java to run that bytecode. Why? What, what, what is this for? All right, so I am gonna do my best here to not talk about this for 50 minutes, um, because this is super interesting. I actually gave a whole lecture on this topic to 196 uh, last year. But here's the historical background. So when Java is being developed, this is still true today. Different computers, different computer processors run different machine code. So my laptop here has an x86 processor in it. My phone, which is over there, has an ARM processor in it. Those two processors essentially speak two different languages. So if I compile a program into machine code that works on my laptop, my phone has no idea what to do with it. Vice versa, if I compile it to machine code that works on my phone, my laptop has no idea what to do with it. You can almost think of this as these two processors speaking different languages. It's not that different. This is still true now, but it was even more true when Java was being developed. And so here's the idea. The idea that Java, Java was designed around this philosophy called write once, run anywhere, and I think they actually did trademark that. The idea was that I would compile my Java code anywhere, on any machine, and then I should be able to take that class file and send it to you or send it to your grandfather or send it anywhere, and someone else should be able to run it, regardless of the differences between my CPU and their CPU. How do we accomplish this? We accomplish this using this separate program called Java. So as long as the computer that you're sending your class file to, so that class file I just created, I could send it to my phone, 
and my phone could execute it. As long as it has this Java virtual machine installed. And that is a big rabbit hole I don't want to go down. But that, so, so that was the, the, this is the idea, this is the plan. This is also, so some of you may have, you know, again, this is one of these days where we get to demystify some stuff, right? There's some things that was like, why wasn't okay, why wasn't it okay for you to install the Java runtime environment? So when you went to the Java website, a few of you got confused and you downloaded the Java runtime environment instead of the Java software development kit. What's the difference between those two things? The difference is that the Java runtime environment only includes the Java virtual machine. It can only run Java code. It can't compile Java code. So in order to compile Java code, in order to create Java programs, you need the Java software development kit, which includes the Java compiler. So, so the Java runtime environment is much more widely installed than the Java software development kit. I have the Java runtime environment installed on my machine because at some point I wanted to run something that was written in Java, and I installed it. And because I'm talking about it, it's probably gonna pop up like an update dialogue right about now. Right? It always seems to do that. Okay. So, so let's step back a minute, right? Which is that, and one of the things I've been pointing out to you, and, and you guys are living at, really on the cusp of this. We'll talk about this more later in the semester because some of the technology trends that drove this explosion in computing power are over, essentially. So the rate at which computers are getting faster is slowing. However, it was so fast for so long that you guys are standing on like this unbelievable wealth of computational power. And it will take a long time for us to get bored with, with all of the compute that we've created. But one of the things that's happened since Java was designed is along with, remember, a compiler is just a computer program. It's just another computer program. It gets faster and more intelligent along with everything else, all the other software that we've written. It's taking advantage of the faster processors. So that's leading to interesting and useful changes in language design. And I'm actually sort of excited, finally, teaching a course in Java that I can actually talk about one of them today. This is not JavaScript. Some of you who've written JavaScript may think it is. You'll see that the Java syntax highlighter doesn't even know what to do with this, but this is valid Java code. As of six months ago. I can do this. So what's going on here? You know, this, this doesn't look right. Where's the type? This is an int. What is the var doing there? Like, why is this okay? This is a new feature in Java 10. So in Java 10, for the first time in Java, they've introduced something called local type inference. What does that mean? Sounds complicated. What it means is that if the compiler can figure out what the type of a local variable is, I don't have to tell it. So you'll see here, this var keyword that's new in Java 10 simply says I'm creating a local variable. It's not a type. It can be used for anything. So what happens here is that when this code is run, the Java compiler says, okay, there's a variable here called integer value. I know the name. They didn't tell me what the type is. How does it know? How can it figure it out? Yeah. Yeah, it looks at the literal. It says, oh, okay, you're initializing this with a literal integer. Therefore, this is an int. I'm good. I know the type. You don't have to tell me. Thank you. You can write this code today. You can use it on your MPs. You can use it on your prayer learn homework. The only place, I'm sorry, you can't use it yet is in the slide playground, so I can't show you an example of this. But this code, I just submitted this code earlier, you know, just to make sure I wasn't lying to you, um, for the array sum problem that we did, and it works. So again, what's happening here? On line one, I'm creating a variable called sum. I am not telling Java what the type of that variable is, but it can figure it out on its own. Same thing here, I'm essentially going through in my for loop creating a variable called i. What's the type of that variable? I don't need to tell Java. It can figure it out, because I'm initializing it to an int. This may look simple now, but this gets incredibly powerful later. 
because there's a lot of times where you're initializing a variable that receives the result of calling some function that you don't understand, right? You're like, I'm gonna get back something and I'm gonna do some stuff with it, and not having to provide the type in that case can be very useful. But this is evidence that even, you know, a somewhat old and crufty language like Java is starting to use the power of modern computers to help you as a developer. Makes your life a little bit easier. Okay. How much, well, how am I doing on time here? No, oh, I've got five minutes, awesome, okay. So, I get to talk about this one last thing. Main. Another chance to demystify something. So you guys have been using main methods. Some of you have noticed that when you run your Java source code using IntelliJ, what code gets executed? Main. But what is main? Well, you think about it. When I execute, when Java executes your code, so I've compiled your code to bytecode and now I'm gonna run it. But the question is, where do I start? What's the first line of code that gets run? In Java and in some other similar, so Java sort of inherited this from other languages, what I do is I provide a special function called main. And that's the function where execution starts. So the main method will always be the first thing that's run in a Java program. Some main method somewhere. When you run our test suites, that main method is sort of buried away and you don't see it. But when you run your programs to test them at the terminal, that main method is exactly what's being run. Okay? The function signature for this is gonna require more explanation, and we'll come back and talk about that in a few days when we talk more about objects. But this is where things start. So if I go back to my example here, if I take out this main method, and then I compile this, I can compile it, it's gonna compile fine. Nothing in it, it's not very interesting. But when I actually go to run this code, it's gonna basically complain. It says, you don't have a main method. So I don't know where to start. You didn't tell me. I could put 10 functions in here, and if they're not called main, the Java program will issue the same error message when I try to run the code. Okay. So the last little bit of information I'll leave you with is this, the arguments that main receives. So I told you that the modifiers, public static void, are gonna require more explanation. Void doesn't require more explanation. Void you already understand. That's the return type of main. That means it doesn't return anything. Static and public we'll get to. But why does main receive, as its argument, a, an array of strings? This is weird. This is the first thing that runs. So where is this information actually coming from? I will leave you guys to think about that as you start to pack up, and I'll be happy to answer questions about this on the forum. All right, so some announcements for today. So we have many of the lecture videos up online. Um, there are, like, two that aren't up yet. One of them is not going to be because there's no audio. Sorry. Um, the other one we just need to finish working on. Um, I'll put up today's. Uh, we're gonna try to post those more quickly. Uh, the goal here is so you can review for the midterm, obviously. Um, so again, on Friday, we're gonna start a new topic. We're gonna start talking about objects. On Monday, I'll be here for 50 minutes to answer any and all questions about imperative programming to prepare you for the midterm. MP2 is due on Monday. It's great preparation for the midterm exam. There is no new MP that will come out next Monday so that you can have time to study for the midterm. Homeworks will continue. I will see you guys on Friday.